Well, thank you so much. It's a very warm and generous uh, welcome. Thank you. Uh, what a joy to be here. Looking at your notices, I feel like I could spend quite a long time in this church and, uh, and be exploring each time. Nerf, sounds brilliant. Parenting, absolutely brilliant. The watch idea, absolutely fantastic. Water, thank you. Um, I'm not going to introduce myself too much because uh, the main event is not me today. It's talking about uh, the church that we're a part of globally uh, and specifically talking about Christians around the world who are facing extraordinary persecution for their faith but are persevering because of a, a compelling vision of Jesus. And, and really what I hope to leave us with today is, is one, a renewed compelling vision of Jesus that I hope, hope helps us to live in a Christ-centered way tomorrow and also to expand our vision of the global church and the things that God is doing around the world that we have the privilege and opportunity to partner in. I want to give us a bunch of scripture verses um, that I'd love you just to kind of take note of, take away and read. Um, we have to live our lives through the lens of scripture, not through the lens of kind of dynamic communicators, but through the lens of scripture, because it's only scripture that will keep us anchored in the faith that will produce the results that the world is longing for, and we are the conduits of that life. So I'm going to share a bunch of uh, scriptures for us to, to anchor in. But just first, I don't know if there have been moments in your life where suddenly it's like your paradigm for life has shifted. It's like you've reopened your eyes in a moment, and suddenly you can see things in a different way. It's like your reality has been rewired in some way, and you know that from that moment on that, Life is never going to be the same. It's never going to feel the same. I've had a load of those moments in my life, as I'm sure we all have. One of those was when I was um, 12, and uh, I was a part of this uh, new small group that was in Birmingham, and uh, it was called a kinship group. Uh, for some of you who've been around for many, many years, you'll recognize the terminology. For many of you, you won't at all. And it was this small gathering of people that just were desperate and hungry, hungry to meet with Jesus and found a way of meeting with Jesus as a small group of people and singing songs that weren't about God, but that were about an encounter with God in that moment. And as a 12-year-old, being in this small group, most of the people there were older than me. In fact, my now mother-in-law was in that group. Um, but I just found as a 12-year-old, I met Jesus in the midst of worship, and it was a beautiful encounter that rewired my reality. It was like a paradigm shift of realizing that God was not just to do with Sundays, it was not just to do with some religious kind of behaviors and practices, but it was, there was an invitation to walk daily in a place of intimacy with God. Rewired my life. When I was 13, <clears throat> this whole kind of agenda that was a part of the small group and the wider movement of which you guys were part of around equipping the saints, again, it blew my mind because I was suddenly made aware that not only did God love me and want me to know him personally, but that he wanted, me, wanted to equip me to do the same works of ministry that Jesus did. That I could hear God's voice and I could speak what I'd heard and it was going to bring revelation to those around me. I could speak what God had given me and it was a word of knowledge that made another person suddenly realize God knows me. Blew my mind, God wants to use us in that way. When I was 14, another rewiring moment, I was at a church much, much smaller than this and uh, much, much more traditional in its, in its style and approach. But this little guy called Chubo, he probably wasn't quite that small, but he was about five foot four. And he was from a, a country in northeast India called Nagaland. Anybody heard of Nagaland? Wow, look at you geographers around the room. I had never heard of Nagaland. And this kind of guy came up. He wasn't dressed as cool as I'm dressed today. Thank you very much. Um, and I wasn't, to be honest, overly expectant. You know, I was a typical 14-year-old, you know, wanting something kind of razzmatazzy. And he got up and he started talking about Nagaland. And he said that as a country, they were now 80% Christian. But that only 40 years before that, they were a nation of headhunters, tribal communities. And you'd go into the villages and have a spear with a skull from a neighboring village. But that men and women had brought the good news of Jesus into that nation, brought a message of forgiveness, brought a message of hope, of life, of new identity, of purpose, and the nation had pretty much wholesale been radically transformed by the grace of God. And as he began to share, you know, you just kind of 
He starts off with kind of lower expectations and then suddenly you're like, wow, this is fascinating and interesting. And then he said, it's a real joy for me to be here today because I didn't think I was going to make it because my sister-in-law died five days ago and this was going to mean we weren't able to come. But he said, one day when visiting, I felt the Lord say to me that this is not unto death. Pray for her. So he said, I prayed for her as she lay there, having been dead for three days, and she sat up and God gave me permission to come to the UK. Now, who here has met someone who's been raised from the dead? Not many of us. You have? Okay, great. Talk to Claire more about that. But for me as a 14-year-old, it, it radicalised my view because not only was Jesus someone to be known personally in intimacy of worship, not only did God want to speak to me and use me for his kingdom, but actually the things that I read about in the New Testament God was still doing those things around the world. In fact, this guy, Chubo, he'd raised 13 people from the dead. 13 people. And numbers are irrelevant in the presence of Jesus, aren't they? Numbers are irrelevant, but we get fascinated. I get fascinated by these moments. But basically, the reality that they were living in was the reality of the context that Jesus brought into the world, where the things of God were possible in the immediate moment. They weren't just hopes for the future or dreams from the past, but they were present realities. Another rewiring moment for me uh, came in February this year. I had the privilege of actually going to be in India. And we were meeting with uh, mostly young adults from across northern India that were coming together to share the things that God was doing with them, but also some of the challenges that they faced. And I met this incredible woman called Shakuntala. Uh, she was uh, 26. And she had had an issue of blood um, from the age of 11. And for 15 years, she had this issue of blood and she had the shame of it and all of that stuff. And then her auntie had come to faith and she invited Shakuntala to go to church with her on a Sunday. And she went along to church and just thought it's okay. Went along a couple more times and about a third or fourth time, she went to church and people had found out that, um, that she had a medical condition. And she'd been to a whole range of different doctors and kind of spiritists about this issue. But she was prayed for on that morning. And she described to us that as she was prayed for, she suddenly felt something change in her body. And the issue of blood stopped in that moment. Now, I'd never met somebody like the story of Jesus in the New Testament where the woman with the issue of blood touches his robe and is instantly healed. And here was this woman in front of me, Shakuntala, sharing the story of an encounter with Jesus where she knew in her body and she had the evidence that she had met with Jesus and Jesus was more powerful than medical provision. Jesus was more powerful than spiritists. Jesus was more powerful than anything. And it just rewired my perspective again. But the other thing she talked about is that she had then gone back to tell her family about the encounter that she'd had with Jesus and this healing that she'd received. And they forbade her from talking to anybody about what had happened. And they said, this cannot have happened. This did not happen. You must deny this. And she said, but I can't deny what has taken place in my body. I know the truth and reality of what has taken place because I'm healed. And they said to her, well, then you have a choice. You either stick by your Jesus and you lose us as a family or you reject Jesus and we'll remain your family. And she said she could not deny the Jesus that she'd met, the Jesus who had healed her body. And so from that moment forward, her family have denied her existence. They've walked past her on the street. They've not had meals with her. And when we met her, two months before that, her father had died, and she'd been denied all access to all of the ceremonial um, burial elements as part of that. And as she shared, a tear rolled down her face, and you could see the pain of that rejection and that isolation because of wanting to be faithful to Jesus. And when she, we prayed for her, and you know, in that situation, your heart is broken with those whose hearts are broken. And then she left, and, and I just couldn't regather myself because I was like, we have had the privilege of hearing Shakuntala's story, meeting her, and then I will come back to churches like here, and I will share that story, and people will be, humbled and broken and inspired. But that story is her life. She's inhabiting that story of rejection for the gospel. 
but also knowing the glory of Jesus. And one of the privileges of this ministry of Open Doors is partnering with local churches around the world to support and resource those churches where following Jesus comes at such a great cost and to support those churches to continue to be salt and light in their communities, to make Jesus known, to strengthen Christians who face just horrendous challenges for their faith. And this kind of rewiring of our values, this kind of paradigm shift was totally the experience of of the disciples in the early church. When they first met Jesus, he came with a message that totally rewired their understanding of the world that they're in, totally rewired their understanding of what God was like, totally rewired their understanding of what was possible, but also totally rewired their understanding of who they were. We read in John 3, 16, don't we, that for God so loved the world, he sent his only son. But then we read later on in John 20, 21, Jesus says to his disciples, as the Father sent me, so I have sent you. As the Father is sending me, so I'm sending you. Wow. I mean, is, is that not a paradigm shift? For them to, to understand, as the Father sent Jesus, Jesus is saying, I am sending you in that same way. And that's not just a paradigm shift for the early disciples. That's the invitation to a paradigm shift for every one of us in this room. If we are saying, Jesus, I'm all in. As you were all in for me, I'm all in for you. As the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. So let's just get that in our minds for a minute. So Jesus is in heaven, we read about in Philippians 2. He, he has equality with God. He doesn't need to grasp at it. He has that security, that sufficiency in the presence of God, the significance of being one with God. He's in that place of security. And what do we read in Philippians 2? That he steps down into earthly reality. From eternal security, he steps down into earthly reality. And then we read he steps down even further in obedience to death. And we read about how he goes even lower. He faces death on a cross. And we read in Ephesians 4 that he then takes captives, those who are held captive. Claire, I need your help. So Claire is a captive. But what does Jesus do? He comes underneath and says, Claire, come on up. And where is Claire now in each verse? Claire is in a place of eternal security, significance with God, the sufficiency of God. And then what does Jesus say? As the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. And so Jesus begins that journey again with Claire, stepping down from that place of security and comfort and saying, go go. That's a paradigm shift, isn't it? That's our reality. That's our identity. That As Jesus was sent, so we have been sent by the Father. We've been lifted up and we seat in heavenly places. We read in Ephesians 2. But that's not so we live there in a place of comfort, so that we follow the pattern of Jesus who was incarnated in order to be with those who are suffering, to meet them in their suffering and to Introduce them to the Father. That's our call. But Jesus also said, he said, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. He's speaking about this gospel, which translates us from one identity to another identity, but says that this new identity is going to cost you that identity. There's an exchange that takes place. And Jesus faced a lot of restriction. A lot of rejection. In fact, he was then killed on the cross. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. And Jesus is trying to help the disciples to understand not only the glory of the gospel and the inheritance of eternal security, but also that there is a cost in this new life in the kingdom. That it means casting off all of the restraints, all of the things of the world. And because you are casting off those things that seem real, that are false, You'll face persecution because of that. It's not the most positive message, is it? But it's really important that our kind of reality is calibrated with God's view of reality. Otherwise, when we face any degree of discomfort or suffering, we begin to interpret that as the evidence of the absence of God. It is not. It's the opportunity of the presence of God. Suffering does not represent the absence of God. And if we have developed a spirituality that God is only God if my life is comfortable, that is not the gospel. That is not the gospel. 
The gospel is, no matter what our earthly experience is, that we have been raised to heavenly places. And actually, the time we have on earth is limited and short. And it's the opportunity to live the life of the kingdom and to influence the world around us. That's a powerful message. It's a powerful message. And what Jesus tells his disciples, if they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. We read in the book of Acts, you looked at Acts 1.8 last week, that Jesus says, the spirit will come upon you and you'll be witnesses from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit is poured out, the power of God to enable these weak human vessels to do what is impossible in their humanity, but all things are possible in God. The raising of the dead is possible in God. It's not possible in Sam's identity. The healing of an issue of blood, possible within the kingdom of God, not possible in Sam's identity. It's this translation, it's the spirit of God is poured out, the message of the kingdom is preached, people begin to come into the kingdom. There's the power of God, there's healing. And then in Acts chapter 4, the religious leaders at the time begin to kind of rise up in restriction and opposition to what God is doing because what God is doing is threatening their earthly security. It's challenging the foundations of their identity and saying, you need to live for something more. There's a different reality which costs this in order to gain this. And the disciples are brought before the Sanhedrin and Peter and John. They're threatened. You must stop speaking of Jesus. A bit like the message to Shakuntali, where you cannot speak of Jesus. But they're like, how can we deny what we know to be true? We have lived with Jesus. We've walked with Jesus. We've turned our back on Jesus when he went to the cross. But then we've seen that Jesus is resurrected. And we know that no matter what this life is about, that Jesus is greater. He has greater authority. He is reality. And what we're living in is not real. They know that. And so they're like saying, we will not keep speaking of Jesus. We will not stop speaking of Jesus. Then the next chapter, because they keep on speaking of Jesus, they're thrown in prison. God sets them free out of prison. They're brought back for the Sanhedrin. They're beaten to tell them, you must not speak of Jesus. But they keep on speaking of Jesus. Then we have introduction to Stephen. And Stephen boldly testifies to who Jesus is and what God is about, and he is killed for his faith. He is stoned to death. Now, we read these Bible stories, and somehow they get rose-tinted. But this is a man of God whose heart was full and burning with love for Jesus because of his encounter, and because of that, he is stoned to death. And we read in Acts chapter 8, the persecution ramped up, and the church was scattered to Judea and to Samaria, and ultimately to the ends of the earth. As people are boldly declaring Jesus, there is opposition and there is restriction. But God even uses that to sow the gospel of the kingdom from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. And this picture of persecution that we read about in the book of Acts is true in the context of the early church. It's true in the context of church history and it's true in the context of the world today. I don't know how many people are here this morning, but if your birthday is in, Oct is in February and March, can you just stand up for a moment if your birthday is in February and March? I haven't got a birthday card for you or anything else. <laughs> and we're not going to sing happy birthday. But just a way of, of kind of getting a sense of reality here. Statistically, one-seventh of the population's birthday is in February March. I mean, I don't know how you work that out, but that should be true. So one-seventh of the UK's birthdays in February March, one-seventh of this church, they're February March. One-seventh of the global church live in contexts where they're facing extreme persecution. So if you look at the people around the room, hopefully people you love, and if you imagine them sitting here or standing here this morning with a story of how they have been abducted this week or how they've lost their job because of their faith, or how their children were put at the back of the class so they couldn't hear the education as a way of, of keeping Christian communities um, illiterate and unable to make a difference. Or that actually one person who's standing here is maybe not standing. Their seat is empty because they've been killed in the last week. That's the reality of the world. So much of our environment wants to cotton wool protect us from a reality that Jesus invites us don't avoid the reality, but step into the reality and bring into that reality my kingdom. Please sit down.
It's 365 million Christians around the world live in a context where persecution is most extreme. That's a huge number of people. And why do they face persecution? They face persecution because they're seeking to share Jesus. They're seeking to share Jesus. If they shut up and they don't share the gospel, they avoid persecution. A bit like Shakuntala was offered, a bit like Peter and John were offered. Just keep it to yourself. Keep it to yourself. But they're like, but how can we not share this good news that has healed me, that has saved me, that has brought me hope and purpose, that has forgiven my past, that has given me hope for the future. How can I not share that with other people that are as lost as I was, that are as broken as I was, that need the power of God as I did? How can I not share that? And because people are sharing Jesus, they are enduring suffering in large parts of the earth. I just want to play a video for you, which is currently uh, the context of life for Christians in Nigeria. Last year, about 5,000 Christians were killed for their faith in Jesus in northern Nigeria. It's a reality that not many people are aware of. And so I just want to play you this video from Pastor Barnabas, which is just a, it's, it's, it's a reality check for the world that we're in and some of the challenge that Christians like the early church faced are facing today. Just 